Lord, I hope that it is, can be said of us that while we may wander from you, that we're always brought back to you. We are always brought back to the heart of worship. And the heart of worship is, it is all about you. Amen. May our lives reflect that simple statement. It's all about you. It's not about me. It's not about any of us. It's all about Jesus. I'm thinking of last week and how the, the Cinderella of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, just shines the light on Jesus. Look at him, focus on him, adore him. Really, that's what it means to be Christ-like. So we come to seek you this morning as we open our Bibles. Speak to us, we pray. And if you be pleased, speak through me to build your church this morning. Amen. Take a seat, get your Bibles out if you would. In the summer of 1967, Kevin Springer attended a student retreat at the headquarters of Campus Crusade for Christ in Arrowhead Springs, California. He'd been a committed Christian for five years, but recently his spiritual life had stalled. Do you ever feel like that? Well, he was looking for more from God, something to empower his life and give him a clear purpose. While there, he heard Dr. Bill Bright present a teaching session on the Holy Spirit. And this was, had to be a move of God because you, if you never met or even heard uh, Dr. Bill Bright, he's a leader, or he was a leader and administrator. He was not a teacher. The staff used to hate when he would, would teach or preach. He wasn't gifted that way. But he had a simple presentation on a lesson of the Holy Spirit. His points are very simple. We cannot successfully live Christian life, the Christian life in our own strength. The Father sent the Holy Spirit to empower us. We are commanded in Scripture to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, even though Kevin had been warned about the excesses of the Pentecostal movement and the Holy Spirit, Dr. Bright's words stirred him deeply. That night, Scott could hardly sleep as he sensed God calling him to open his heart um, to the Holy Spirit. So he slipped out of bed and found a quiet place under a palm tree and prayed, Holy Spirit, I've been living in my own strength too long. Now I yield every part of my life to you. Come and fill me. A simple, unemotional prayer. What happened next was beyond anything Kevin had been taught about how God works. First, he felt a rush of power come over his body, a warm, tingling feeling he had never before experienced. And with that rush came a peace and an urge to worship God. As he began worshiping, he was soon speaking in tongues, though initially he was unsure of what it was. After praying and worshiping for an hour, he opened his Bible and began reading, late into the night. Scripture came alive as the word of God leapt, leapt off the pages. The very next day, as he was witnessing at Newport Beach, he received insights about the teenagers, sexual sins, problems with parents, problems at school that were right on target. Within 30 minutes, several of the teenagers were weeping, falling to their knees, repenting of their sins, and turning to Christ. In several cases, students who initially joined the conversation only to mock and ridicule ended up on their faces, weeping, trembling, and repenting. Now, can you relate to Kevin's story? Having faithfully walked with God for years, yet your Christian experience is marked by consistent failure and defeat. There has to be more, perhaps, you quietly thought to yourself. Because what I read in the Bible and what I experience in my own life seem to be quite different. What am I missing? Well, the answer is you need power. It's that simple. You need power. And power comes from the Holy Spirit. Here's a story of D.L. Moody's experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. It really illustrates the importance of a desiring to be empowered or filled with the Holy Spirit. 
uh, the son of Mr. Moody, in writing the life story of his father, say that there was a crucial year in the life of this famous preacher. I want to pause here for a moment. Kevin Springer had, was a young Christian who'd been walking with the Lord for five years. D.L. Moody was a believer and then a pastor for years. And here they have these experiences with the Holy Spirit. During the year 1871, Mr. Moody became more and more aware of how, he, how little he was fitted for his work. An intense hunger and thirst for spiritual power was aroused in him by two women who would attend the meetings and sit in the front seat. He could see by their expressions that they were praying. At the close of the services, they would say to him, we've been praying for you. Why don't you pray for the people, Mr. Moody would ask, because you need the power of the Holy Spirit, they would say. I need the power? Why, said Mr. Moody, in relating the incident years later, I thought I had the power. I had the largest congregation in Chicago, and there were many conversions. I was, in a sense, satisfied. But right along, those two godly women kept praying for me. And their earnest talk about anointing for special service set me to thinking. I asked them to come and talk with me, and they poured out their hearts in prayer that I might receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. There came a great hunger into my soul. I didn't know what it was. I began to cry out as I never did before. I never... I really felt that I did not want to live if God could not have this power for service, if I could not have this power for service, excuse me. Then the Chicago fire came and Moody became involved in the work of raising funds for the building of the Northside Tabernacle. But during a trip east, the hunger for more spiritual power seized him again. My heart was not in the work for begging or, or pleading, he said. I could not appeal. I was crying all the time that God would fill me with his spirit. But one day in the city of New York, oh, what a day, he says, I cannot describe it. I seldom refer to it. It is almost too sacred an experience for me to name. Paul had an experience of which he never spoke of for 14 years. I can only say that God revealed himself to me, and I had such an experience of his love that I had to ask him to stay his hand. I went to preaching again. The sermons were not different. I did not present any new truths, yet hundreds were converted. I would not now be placed back where I was before that blessed experience if you should give me all the world. It would be as small as dust in the balance. When R.A. Torrey presented his message entitled when, Why God Used D.L. Moody, he named several qualities which were evident in the reasons for his usefulness. The last one named, and the most important one, was this. Moody was definitely endued with power from on high. Speaking of R.A. Torrey, this is his experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. I recall the exact spot where I was kneeling in prayer in my study. It was a quiet moment, one of the most quietest moments I ever knew. Then God simply said to me, not in any audible voice, but in my heart, it's yours, now go and preach. He'd already said it to me in his word in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, but I did not know my Bible as I know it now. And God had pity on my ignorance and said it directly to my soul. And I went and preached. And I've been a new minister from that day to this. Sometime after this experience, while sitting in my room one day, Suddenly, I found myself shouting, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, and I could not stop. But that was not when I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I took him by simple faith in the word of God. That's in Dr. Ari Torrey, the Holy Spirit, who he is, and what he does. Three men who had a different encounter with the Holy Spirit but the result was the same. They left empowered for service. In 1 Corinthians chapter three, verses one through three, I'm gonna build off of what we talked about last week. We read this. 
if you can see this. This is Paul speaking to the Corinthians. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men. You see that, the word spiritual there? Spiritual, number one. But as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. So there's two different types of people he's talking about. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like a third group of people, mere men? Okay? The mere men are like, they're, they're full of strife and conflict and so on. There are three types of people that Paul's addressing in this church. You have this person right here, which we call the natural person. This would be the unbeliever. Notice in a simple diagram, where is Christ? Outside this life. And who's controlling? Who's on the throne? Self. Okay? If this is the heart, self is in control. Christ is outside the life. Who directs the decisions and actions? Self does. Okay? The result is frustration, but Jesus is outside the life. Pretty simple, right? This is the unbeliever. We all start off here. For the most part, almost all the time, whenever someone does come to Christ, notice that Christ is in the life. Like when you first became a Christian, was Jesus on the throne of your life and did he direct you? No, he did not because you didn't know, right? Right? You simply pray a prayer of salvation, and the prayer is simply this. I receive you, Jesus Christ, to do what? As my Savior for the forgiveness of my sins. And he, God gives you his nature and everything in the, in the Holy Spirit and whatnot. He dwells inside you, but is he directing your life? And you would say, no. Kevin Springer, the first five years of his life, something was missing. D.L. Moody, years of his life in ministry, something was missing. Okay? So Jesus is in the life, but he's not in control. Okay? Self was on the throne directing decisions and actions. So the difference between this person life, the self directed life, and this life is what? There's only one difference. Where's the cross? In the life, but look at the life. The dots are the same. See that? This is the majority of believers today. I said this is, another way of putting it, this is that Ford Mustang. Totally souped up Ford Mustang, the, the keys aren't in it. Right? This is that Ford, uh, what I call it? Fiesta. Fiesta. Okay, no power. Yeah, 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 you got power here, but you ain't using it, right? Then there's this person here. The spiritual person. That's who Paul wants to address them. I want to address you as spiritual. This would be the spirit-filled person. The person that's been empowered by the spirit. Baptized with the spirit. Okay? They have yielded or surrendered their life. That's what Kevin Springer prayed. I yield my life to you. And this empowerment came upon him. So Jesus is in the life and on the throne. Selfless yielding to Jesus. And notice the life is directed by Jesus and it has its influence and direction in their life. It's a really simple, again, this is the unbeliever or the mere men. This is the carnal Christian, okay, or men of flesh or infants in Christ. And this is a spirit-filled believer, okay? Again, each of the three men, Kevin Springer, D.L. Moody, and R.A. Torrey, they began as a natural person, an unbeliever, then became a carnal person or a believer, and eventually became a spiritual person or a spirit-filled believer. While they were all indwelt by the Holy Spirit at salvation as a believer, they were empowered by the Holy Spirit as a spirit-filled believer after salvation. You understand that? Okay? This separate experience of uh, of the Holy Spirit, his, this empowering, this filling, it's nothing new from the perspective of the Bible. Get your Bibles out, turn to Acts chapter 2. Okay? Acts chapter 2. Acts 
The last time I talked about this was five years ago. And perhaps shame on me for not keeping this in front of us because if it's true, and I believe it is, that the Christian life is a spirit-filled life, we need constant reminder to be filled, controlled with the Holy Spirit. By the way, do you understand, if you go back to, to you, this may be you, you, know, you have this encounter with the Holy Spirit, okay, you're, you're a believer, but you're, you haven't quite yielded your life to Jesus Christ. Remember the, the dwell in your heart through faith? Remember that story, my heart, Christ's home? If you aren't yielding to him every area, then this is you. You're short-circuiting power. You need to get to here. A, a surrender, a complete surrender to him. That he may then fill you. And one of the first evidences will be you will learn to love. You will begin to view the world and your life through a foundation of love. And that will be your first response. It will take time, but that's Jesus living his life through you. Okay? So, in Acts chapter 2, let's look at this. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So now, these are believers, right? They believed in Jesus Christ by faith. Now they have this experience of the Holy Spirit and they're speaking in tongues, which is a, it was a, a human language that they did not know. And the result of the Holy Spirit falling upon the disciples, what was it? Well, let's look at verses 37 and 38 and verse 41 of Acts chapter two. Peter, who ran in fear of being identified with Christ for his life, now is emboldened to preach. And here's what happened. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So then those who have received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. Now last week I shared with you the results of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember those? I put them up here because they're so important. You know, you'll have the power to boldly witness and do miracles. In Acts 1.8, Jesus promises us power to be his witnesses. That's what we just read. Fearful Peter without the Spirit. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is Peter with the Spirit in Acts. See the difference? Boldness. The fear is gone. Because God hasn't given us what? A spirit of fear or of timidity, but of power and of love and of discipline. So the power to boldly witness and do miracles, the ability to speak in tongues, we see that, we just read that. I added this one, the power to increasingly surrender to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You need power to slay yourself, to kill yourself, to die to self. If there's one battle that I hate, that I, it's just constant, is a battle with myself. To live a life characterized by love, that comes with being filled with the Spirit. The result in God working powerfully through the believer to do the unimaginable. Now the result of being filled with the Spirit is you will worship, you will praise and give thanksgiving. There'll be mutual submission to one another. These are all were results of receiving or the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I added this one, that you have the power to grow in perseverance. That is never fun to have to endure, is it? To, to suffer patiently, to, to, in those circumstances, to be full of joy and thanksgiving to God. Those are not normal responses to Life, but that's how we respond because we have a power source. These results that we just looked over, 
They come after we've been baptized or filled or empowered with the Holy Spirit. So let's talk about this phrase, the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You're reading the book of Acts. Go back to chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. We find this. Gathering together, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem. This is Jesus before his ascension. But to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard of from me. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now the question becomes, because we talk about baptisms, we get confused. How many baptisms are there? Well, there are three baptisms. Okay? And you should know this by heart by now. The first baptism is this. The Spirit baptizes us into the body of Christ at salvation. Okay? That verse 1 Corinthians 12, 12 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For, if one, for in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. It's the Spirit that baptizes you into the body of Jesus Christ. It happens at salvation, okay? You're placed in Christ, and what that means is that when he was on the cross dying, so were you. When he died, you died. When he was raised from the dead, you were raised from the dead, okay? Read Romans, it describes this in detail. Then he went to be with the Father in heaven, where he waits for you who are now given a new life to live. And when you die, you will go be with him in heaven because you've been raised up and seated with him so that you will sit with him in the heavenly places at the right hand of God because you've been placed in Christ. It's an awful lot, isn't it? That's your destiny, that's your hope. I don't need to mention an inheritance that awaits you, okay? But that's what the Spirit does. He baptizes you into the body of Christ. Okay? That's 1 Corinthians 12, 12. Then there's the second baptism, which is water baptism. I say, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. What? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's referring to water baptism. Remember the story of the, of the eunuch that we read? The, the, the transgender person that, that had faith in Christ? He knew he, he needed to believe, and then he knew he needed to be baptized, and what did Philip do with him? They came upon water, and he was baptized in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to be baptized. Does it change anything about you, water baptism? No. The moment that you were baptized into Christ at salvation, he gave you a new nature. The baptism, a water baptism more specifically, is simply you identifying with the body of Christ and saying, I'm one of you, I'm with you guys. It's an outward act of an inward change. Does that make sense? That's all that it is. Okay? You don't earn salvation by being baptized, water baptism. Okay? But that's the second baptism. Okay? The third one is what we're talking about this morning. That Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. Now, I just want you to listen to these verses because I put them all up there. What I want you to notice is this. What is this book? It's Matthew. What do we call Matthew? It's a gospel record, right? What do we call Mark's book in the Bible? A gospel record. What do we call Luke? A gospel. And John, a gospel. How many gospels are there in the Bible? Well, there are four gospels, right? Matthews, Marks, Luke's, and John. They are all recording this event. Do you understand the significance of this? So, for example, the woman that was caught in adultery, where do we find that? Is it in the Gospel of John? Do we find it in any other book? I don't believe so. Why only one book and not other three? Well, it's important, but this is in every gospel, and Luke records it in Acts. That is significant for you to remember. This is very, very important, to be baptized by Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 says this, I baptize you with water for repentance, this is John 
the Baptist speaking, but he who is coming after me, meaning Jesus, is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, there's a third baptism, a third experience of the Holy Spirit. Mark 1.8, I have baptized you with water. Again, John the Baptist speaking, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke wrote this, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who was mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit with fire. The same thing. John 1, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descended and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So he's watching the Holy Spirit fall upon Jesus, and he's being told, this is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And of course, we read Acts 1, 4, and 5 earlier. Jesus said, wait for the helper, the promised Holy Spirit. Now here's the deal. Most believers, I'll see if, let me finish this sentence, a little fill in the blank here. Most believers are blank baptism believers today. Most believers are blank baptism believers today. Well, they're two baptism believers, right? They what? They've come to Christ, first baptism, water baptism. They're two baptisms. You got me? This explains the poor witness of many Christians today. They're simply trying to live the Christian life without the necessary power. Now, I want to ask this question, though. Well, why are we hesitant to be baptized with the Holy Spirit? Well, some is just flat-out ignorance. But one of Satan's chief strategies is to keep you blind to the power available to you to live the Christian life the way Jesus did. Okay? We'll get into this in a moment here, but the, like the Ephesian believers in Acts 19, they didn't know about the Holy Spirit the forgotten God. In fact, God, the 20th century was the century of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that? What happened at the the turn in the early 1900s? Yeah, it was the the birth of the charismatic Pentecostal movement and all those churches and so on. Where's the spirit before then? It was still there. But he kind of exploded on the scene and the gifts of spirit were talked about more and more and more and stuff like that. Number two, Satan has used the experience of Pentecostals in the Assemblies of God, for example, in their questionable theology to divide the church. Let me explain when I, talk, when I say this, because this has been something I've dealt with all my years in ministry. If you look at the Assemblies of God website, they have this, this very accurate theological statement called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It says that all believers are entitled to and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father. Well, who's the promise of the Father? Holy Spirit. They call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire. I personally would not use the word fire in that because what does that mean? Okay? But according to the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, this is all great stuff. This was a normal experience of all in the early Christian church. Yep. With it comes the endowment of power for life and service, the bestowment of the gifts and their uses in the work of ministry. This is what basically we have on our, our website, what the, the church that has a cessationist position in terms of the, the Holy Spirit, John MacArthur's church, has this. Grace you know, in Auburn has this. This is standard fare for the Holy Spirit. Now, they call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Other places call it the empowerment or the filling of the Holy Spirit. The problem lies with this. According to the, the Assemblies of God from their website, they call what it's the IPE. Remember that phrase? The initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This is the baptism of believers in the Holy Spirit is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them utterance. Now, of course, they're going to base that on what? Some of these verses we're going to look at, but we just read in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost what happened. The Holy Spirit fell upon them, and what happened to the people? They spoke in tongues, and the tongues were what? 
other human languages, okay? Now here's the problem with that, is that what's happened over time is that, I don't wanna put this, did D.L. Moody have an experience where he spoke in tongues? There's no record of that. Was he filled or empowered with the Holy Spirit? Did R.A. Torrey have that experience? No, but he was certainly filled and God used him in a powerful way. Over time, what has happened is that two, two things happened that, that aren't good. One was that it created, this theology created within the body of Christ a two class um, of Christians. Those that have spoken in tongues and those who haven't. And if you're in a charismatic or Pentecostal circle, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you are less than. Because you're supposed to have this initial physical evidence of being, you're, you're only filled with the Spirit, baptized the Spirit, if you speak in tongues. Okay? That's the initial physical evidence. The other issue is that they're basically going to say that everybody speaks in tongues, which there's a gift of tongues, and not everyone has that gift. The other thing is that the bad thing is because of this, other churches have completely moved away from this the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in an unjustified manner. So much to the point that they say even the gift of tongues is divisive, which is a ridiculous statement to make because every gift of the Holy Spirit is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's a revealing of the Holy Spirit. It's who he is. So to say that any gift is divisive is to say who is divisive? The Holy Spirit. And that simply isn't true. So you have powerless Christians over here and yet Christians with questionable theology over here. Can you speak in tongues? Yes, if that's something that God gives you. Okay? But to say that it's the initial physical evidence, um, while that was an experience for me, you know, Dr. Bright never spoke in tongues. Did God use him in a powerful way? Absolutely. He had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that would make him apostle in many ways. He had like a third heaven experience. Did you know that? Yeah. And so, as we'll see in Scripture, there's a pattern here of receiving the Spirit and speaking in tongues. Tongues, unfortunately, has fallen on hard times as of late. And we don't need to walk away from it. We need to embrace it if that's what the Spirit gives you. And what I've noticed is, you might remember this, that churches will say, well, I'm open to this movement of the Holy Spirit, but I'm cautious. I hate that phrase, open but cautious. Are you told to earnestly seek the Spirit? The promise of, then seek it wholeheartedly. Don't just be open. The open means it's an excuse for me not to seek him and his power is filling they have the cautious, I'm cautious about it. Cautious about what? I know pastors that have, I read a story of a pastor that was sitting in an office one day, the Holy Spirit fell upon him and he started speaking in tongues and he didn't want it because of, of this un misunderstanding, abuse of tongues and he just didn't want it but he was filled with such joy and he was speaking in tongues and he was enjoying it but he said he didn't want it and the Spirit spoke to him and said, I will take it away from you <laughs> if that's what you want. And then he finally surrendered to God. See, he couldn't deny what was happening to him. It was biblical, okay? So there's been this division in the church, and so they, every church lists this empowerment, okay? But not every church, what I'm trying to do, uh, for a second time here, leads you into this experience. You need this. You need multiple fillings, okay? Over and over and over. We learned last week. Number four. Um, well, number three. Uh, yeah, Western Christians, with our rational mindset, we find the gift of tongues weird, which we shouldn't. And number four, conservative evangelical theology says there is no need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, why? Because you've already received the Holy Spirit at salvation. The first baptism 
1 Corinthians 12, 12, and the third baptism, Matthew 3, 11, mark all that, they are the same event, they say. So when you are a believer, they would say this, which is not true, okay? They're gonna say this, that when you're a believer, you immediately go to here. Is that your experience? No, no. There is a separate experience of the Holy Spirit, okay? I think this is where I left off. Any questions so far? What? Well, that was more of a symbolic act as I looked into that, okay? Because they already were believers back then, all right? Because I had a question about that this week. I was like, yeah, well, it really just means it was more of a symbolic act of, of them because it talks about the ability to forgive sins and so on, which they would, you know, only God can forgive sins. But it's, it's, a, it's a long technical answer. But either way, they received the Holy Spirit, which is clear, at Pentecost. It was a unique time in history, okay? When we believe, we get the Spirit. They believed before the Spirit was there. They didn't need the Spirit, though, did they? Because who did they have? Jesus, exactly. Now, what did the Scriptures say about the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Well, after telling the disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit, he tells them why. And you're in the book of Acts, right? Go to chapter 1, verse 8. And this is what I've been saying the whole time. But you will receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria into the end of the earth. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? What would this empowering look like? We went over that. We're in Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they spoke in tongues, which were human languages that they didn't know of, and they were praising God, and they were empowered to boldly witness, which is what Peter did, and 3,000 souls were added. That's what it looked like, okay? That's what it looked like, okay? Any questions so far? Here's some observations then from what we've talked about, that the Spirit bapt, well, here we go. Baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled, received the gift of the Holy Spirit are three different phrases describing the same experience. Okay? One result of being baptized with the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues, human languages, praising God, which we've seen that, Acts chapter 2. One result of being baptized with the Holy Spirit was boldness and effectiveness in witnessing. Now this is important. Repent was the message of Peter. It means accept Jesus Christ your Savior. Be water baptized and then receive the Holy Spirit. And this pattern, as we'll see, is repeated in Acts 8, 10, and 19. Remember this pattern. Repent or believe. Water baptism and then receive the Holy Spirit. And notice this. It is for everybody. It's for everyone. It's for all. Everyone for whom God calls to himself. So we're going to begin to see a pattern here throughout the Bible. Now, since this gift of a promise is the Holy Spirit is for all, we should see this pattern throughout the rest of the New Testament. The question is, do we? Let's talk about the pattern. Go to Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. And again, I say to you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John talk about the importance of being baptized with the Holy Spirit that comes from Jesus. He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. We see it happening for the first time ever in Acts chapter 2. But in Acts 8, Acts 10, and in Acts 19, we're going to see the same thing happen. Why are we seeing these repeated stories over and over and over again? If you are writing a book, or if you are preaching something, or you're parenting a child, or if you're a, <coughs> a spouse trying to convince a spouse about a point you're making, what are you, what's the thing that you do over and over and over again? You repeat it over and over and over again, right? Okay? So let's look at Samaria, verse 14. Now when the apostles of Jerusalem 
at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Now why is that significant? What was in Samaria? Samaritans, and they were what? Half Jews, they're half Gentile, half Jews, and they were despised by the Jews. So now we have these pure, pure Jews, the disciples, Peter and John and, and all the, the 12 disciples. They heard that Samaria received the word of God. They then sent Peter and John, reputably the two leaders of the early church, who came down and what they do? They prayed for these dogs, is really how they viewed them, that they might what? Receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? They believed in him. That was salvation, okay? Then they laid their hands on them, and they what? Received the Holy Spirit. So here's the Holy Spirit. They received him. He indwelt them at the moment of salvation. That's the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now they received the Holy Spirit in a second event when the disciples laid their hands on him. Turn to Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 44. It's a great story. Have this right, Acts chapter 10, the story of Cornelius. Is that right? Verse 44. Yeah. What Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. So what happened here? Let me take it back a little bit. Remember the story of Cornelius? Peter is at, I think, the house of Simon the Tanner. And he's upstairs on the, on the lanai meditating, and the, he has this vision. All of a sudden, in the middle of the vision, a voice calls out to him. It says, you know, arise, Peter, kill and eat. And it was him killing and eating an unclean animal. All right? And what happens is, is that then someone comes to him and tells him that there's people here to see you, and they take him to a Gentile, which they never talked to. Jews and Gentiles never connected. They both despise each other. And as he sees these people waiting, he realizes that what he would call unclean, God called clean, and he needed to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and he does. And while he was still saying these things, what happens? The Holy Spirit fell on these Gentiles, on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Because what message had Jesus said to them? I came to the house of Israel. I came to speak to Jews only. And they thought that they were only going to Jews. And God says, no. You will receive power to be my witnesses where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the earth. Exactly. And they're amazed why? Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And how they know? For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Okay, so now we have the three baptisms. They believe, baptism with water, and a baptism by Jesus of the Holy Spirit. That, and in this case, it manifested itself how? They spoke in tongues and they praised God. Okay, does that sound familiar? It's Acts chapter two, the same pattern. Holy Spirit falls upon them, they, they, they believe, they're you know, baptized, they're speaking in tongues, praising God. Turn to Acts chapter 19. We're going to finish up here in a minute. Verses 1 through 7. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So they are this type, the people at Ephesus, they are this type of person right here. Okay? They didn't know there was the Holy Spirit. They believed, 
And when they believed, where was the Holy Spirit? Indwelling them. When they died, they went to heaven. Okay? But they didn't know there was the Holy Spirit. Okay? Which is the case for so many, too many today. Okay? Let's go back here. Verse 3, and he said, into what were you then baptized? He said, into John's baptism. And what was John's baptism? Believe, right? Repent and believe. And Paul said, John baptized the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him. That is Jesus. That's, that's when you come to Christ. That's, the Holy Spirit baptizes you in the body of Christ. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid hands on them, now what is the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus? What did Peter just do? They baptized him with water, okay? Now, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Look at this, verse six. And when Paul had laid hands on them, what happened? A third experience, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began what? And prophesying. Now, what did, what did, uh, Acts, what did Peter say in Acts chapter two? The, what those people were experiencing was what the prophet Joel had prophesied about, that your young men will what? See visions, your old men will dream, dream, however it goes, you get the idea here. Men and women will have dreams and visions. That which was limited to the prophets, like Elijah, or Elisha, or Isaiah, is now open for everybody, okay? This guy ever spoken to you in a dream or a vision? He has me. That's because this is what comes with the, the Holy Spirit, okay? And there are about 12 men in all. So again, what's the pattern? Here's the observations. The pattern is generally followed. They repent, they believe. Water baptism, they say you're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, what that means. With Cornelius, they receive the Holy Spirit. And again, there's power to effectively witness, to speak in tongues, to praise God and prophesy. They were the results of receiving the Holy Spirit. So now, we are done this morning. This is a basic 101 on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It is a separate experience from salvation. These, I open with those three stories to give you three different experiences. But what I want you to understand is that every one of those three men okay, were believers for a while before they were baptized with the Holy Spirit or received the Holy Spirit or were empowered or filled with the Holy Spirit, as the scriptures say. You can even be a pastor and have a large congregation and never be filled with the Spirit. So you must be filled, baptized with, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now what D.L. Moody went through is a desire for that, a longing for that. Other believers, can, you can share your examples of this. Let me share an example of this, this pattern. There's a, 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 in the church in Bowling Green that I served as a campus pastor, one of the elders' wife's name was, is, is Gemma Eberly. Gemma comes from an Italian family. Her parents speak Italian. She doesn't. Her sister, I think if she has sisters or, or brothers, I can't remember, I think she does. They don't speak Italian. She didn't speak Italian. She got involved in the Charismatic Movement at Bowling Green State University, experienced, as a believer, the, received the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and she started to speak in tongues. She thought to herself, this sounds an awful lot like Italian. So she went home, it was late at night, and she woke her dad up, and she says, Dad, guess what? I was baptized with the Holy Spirit, received the gift of tongues. I think I can speak Italian. Is this Italian? And she started speaking in tongues. And her dad, who was kind of groggy, and when he woke up, he looked up at her, and he said, why are you speaking Italian? Why are you saying, I'm a little freed one singing his praises? Now, she had no idea what she was saying because she didn't speak Italian, but through the Holy Spirit, she was enabled to speak this other language. Now, I'd say to you, based upon the Bible, is that experience biblical? 
Yes. Okay? You don't need to freak out at that. All right? But you must enter into this experience. And with D.L. Moody and others, there was a, a time of preparation that they went through. One of the things that we didn't talk about is that often it's a crisis point in your life. And that's what D.L. Moody had, a crisis point, where he just surrendered completely self to God, and God then was able to fill him with his spirit. Now, does that sound like what we've been through the last week? The sermon, right? That Jesus Christ might dwell in your heart through faith, so you learn to love, and understand love, and then you're filled to all the fullness of God. Then God is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. This is what I'm asking you to enter into, to begin to seek. Okay? Now, what I'm going to ask you to do this week is different. Obviously, you can always do this. Again, I say to you, if you can't fall asleep, listen to my sermon, but I'm going to ask you to do this again. Listen to this. Meditate on this. Okay? At least one more time this week. Because next week, we'll talk about tongues. We'll answer a question about tongues. And then I'll invite whoever is here if they want to not rededicate your life to Christ, but maybe resurrender yourself to the Spirit. Or pray to receive the Spirit into, if you haven't done that already, and you can come forward. This is something that is a promise to you. Now, I have done this. When I was a young boy, I came to Christ in a, a, a charismatic tradition. A few days later, I was explained this whole message. I didn't really understand what it, what it was, but I just knew I needed the Spirit. I was supposed to speak in tongues, and I asked the Spirit to speak in tongues. And with some encouragement, it's hard to explain, but I just started kind of babbling, and they said, that's it. And I went home, or went to my parents' place after this camp, and they weren't pleased that that had happened, because I think it should just kind of happen if it's was. They thought that was coached into it. Either way, it was confirmed years later when I was called to speak in tongues at a youth group meeting and it was interpreted. Okay? But since that time, off and on, I've had to re my life to Christ. But the gift of the Holy Spirit has become so important to me. He has disclosed to me time and time again the future, what is to come. Because I said, that's what the Holy Spirit does, Right? When I told another believer at a baseball game in Indiana what my future was, where I was going, I was coming out here and the Holy Spirit had disclosed that, she said, I wish I had that. Well, you do. You do. But are you seeking him? Are you asking that? It requires effort, a pursuit of him. Okay? But that all comes down to the desire and ability that only comes from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so if you know anybody that that is struggling as a believer and is lacking something, tell them this stuff. Okay? You don't have to live a defeated life. You will always struggle with your flesh and sin. I get that but you can live on a different level. You can learn to, when you're insulted, respond in love. One of my first responses, and I think that some of the elders here can say it because it's happened here, but when someone is offended with me or they, 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 something happens, my response is, well, how can I help them? You know why I always say that, how can I help you? I assume that they're in the what? The trap of offense. And instead of taking the insults, I want to reach out and help them to get them out of that. That comes through the filling of the Holy Spirit and experience over time. And that's what we all need. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for this time. We need you to live the Christian life. Speak to us this week. Prepare our hearts for next week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.